Okay, so welcome to our next um, session or whatever else that we're doing today. So I'm, like I said today, it's a whole new vision, a whole new feeling. I had a wonderful day yesterday and talking with Peter, the astrologer who is in Bali, and I've been wanting for some time to do some kind of humanitarian work and really help in Bali. And it was very exciting to talk to him and find out there's a lot of orphanages and um, places like that right now in Bali, which literally because of COVID have been affected, they need funds, there's so many kids without shoes and things like that. So Peter and I got chatting on these ideas about doing more humanitarian work because as part of the new vision of City Awakening that we're sharing about, which Grace was sharing about bringing you know, abundance into all areas of life was how can we really do good, not just in terms of teaching, but on a practical level. And that was what we started asking. And a few years ago, Sammy and I actually tried to give money to Bali, but it was actually quite humorous. We couldn't find anyone who responded to any of our um, messages trying to find places. So we thought as a sign of the times, and I ended up saying to Sammy, look, unless we're actually, um, I'd like to be doing it somewhere where we know what's going on, how the money's being used and there's accountability. And without me saying much to Peter, that was the idea he came up with. So to cut a long story short, I gave him 500 US as a donation, and that is going to be buying a significant amount of shoes for an orphanage over in um, there. And he went to the orphanage, took some videos and sent them, and it was quite exciting. We're on the phone this morning having a further chat about it. So to come long story short, this is a project we've, we've decided we're going to start focusing on to actually do something to help these orphanages in Bali, help the less fortunate. It's a very good what's called karma yoga, which cleansing karma and helping, helping, the, helping the less fortunate and giving back and bringing what we see our religion into the practical affairs as well as the teaching affairs to really help people. So, um, yeah, one of the things I shared with Grace as co-pastor um, of the church, as whatever we want to call it, that it's really important that we start doing this and start giving people very clearly more than before the opportunity to, to tithe, to give donations to the work, which can be used not only to fund the work and increase awakening, but to be able to help people like Peter to do more of that kind of work. Because um, he's he loves doing that kind of stuff, he told me, as well as astrology reading, to be able to help um, help kids and to help expand the awakening work. And we've been talking today about going into India and other places eventually. So I just wanted to share that with you. And we'll be sharing more about that over the coming week as Peter and I get this project together. So if in principle you like that, just type a Y in the text chat if that kind of interests you because we're looking at even then possibly assuming that of even turning it into some kind of proper foundation or work that will actually give back to help help humanitarian projects and the less fortunate. So if anyone's kind of resonates to that or is interested with it, just type a Y in the chat. I'm just curious to see who gets a good feeling about that. Because for me, it's quite exciting. I really get very excited when doing things for people, which for us, we actually take as normal. And I've seen the example of my cousins who are missionaries, like um, Kelly Chisholm and um, Leslie Hewitt, you know, Leslie's past, my aunt, who did extraordinary work in Cambodia and helping after the Pol Pot regime, and my cousin Kelly and what she's done for Rwanda after the genocide, the poverty, the rape of the women, and the way they've been involved in setting up healing groups and making a huge difference. And I've always admired and been excited by what they've done and speak, as some of you know, almost in reverence of them. And so to actually now have some involvement myself, but I've always wanted to have something where I know what's going on. Peter went there, he's getting the orphanages to give him plans so they don't just spend the money, like how it's going to be used. The plan is I'm going to actually fly into Bali and do a pilgrimage in the next four to six weeks and go with him to temples and go to these orphanages, meet these people and actually see firsthand myself what happens. So it's something that I... Never quite thought I'd do on that level, but it's it's exciting. So it's a bit of a new dawn for City Awakening to awaken the cities, not just in terms of teaching the practical, but you know, teaching the spiritual stuff and the esoteric, but practically getting in there and making a difference. And I know this was always one of Sammy Strings, who is my partner, for those of you who don't know who died eight months ago, was to actually go and help these kind of places. So anyway, that's just what I wanted to start with sharing and very grateful to Grace for stepping up and getting this moving and helping leave with a lot more of what's going on. So today I'm going to be sharing with, I know for some of you, you're here because you're quite excited by the possibility of hearing Neville Goddard who, and learning about this. And 
This is, he's one of, um, I know, few people, many people's favorite teachers and with good reason. I mean, Neville Goddard was a pastor of the New Fort Church, I think it was over in, um, over in basically Mississippi or somewhere in America, and made a huge difference in people's lives and prosperity, relationships, really by teaching the Bible more in a very, what it really is, an esoteric map. So rather than seeing it as such a literal book, the way many of the religions have taught it to date, I'm not dismissing the fact that some of these events have literally happened and there's evidence of that, but he looked at more the esoteric mind mapping that you can see from the scriptures and what they actually teach you in terms of consciousness and how, and how the scriptures is one of the most amazing like maps of the subconscious mind and the power of how to manifest what you're looking to manifest. So let's just start with the prayer of Yeshua. I always like to start and activate that and just invite the higher councils, the archangels, the those of the order of Enoch and the order of Melchizedek and Yeshua, and just invite that, that and feel the blood of Christ surrounding and protecting this work. And I'd like to know who would like to come on and read the Lord's Prayer. Just type a Y or just come on, take the mic for vote. If, if someone happy to come and do that, it'd be nice for someone to read it. On the law of averages, there's 12 other people, so someone's going to say yes eventually. Oh, Fiona. Hi, Fiona. Hi, Warren. Mm, I might need my glasses. Two seconds. I'm on my phone. Okay. Or some sort of magnifying tool, at least. <laughs> yeah. O thou from whom the breath of life comes, who fills all realms of light, sound, and vibration, may your light be experienced in my utmost holiest, your heavenly domain approaches. Let your will come true in the universe, all that vibrates, just as on earth that is material and dense. Detach the, detach the fetters of fault that bind us, karma, like we let go of the guilt of others. Let us not be lost in superficial things, materialism, common temptations, but let us be freed from that that keeps us off from our true purpose. From you comes the all-working will, the lively strength to act, the song that beautifies all, and renews itself from age to age. Amen. Sealed in trust, faith, and truth, I confirm with my entire being. Great. Thanks, Fiona. So we start with having 13 on the actual live webinar, and I'm sure there's many, I know there's many others who listen to the recording. So 13 is actually a very sacred number, according to the um, Pistis Sophia book and the Keys of Enoch, and even the Bible. G there was Jesus and the 12 disciples. The 13 always talks about a day of miracles. Um, so as we say that we dropped the 12, but <laughs> we had 13 at, when we, at that point. So all about miracles and things like that. So it's a good number in terms of the miraculous is what Neville got I teached about. So today's word I got was the I Ching, for the I Ching was I got this. And a bit of an unusual one, really. I was kind of like, okay, not quite sure what it means, but I'll read it. It may resonate with people. It may not. Um, so I'm just going to kind of get it up. It's hexagram 17, which turns into hexagram 43. So anyway, let's have a little bit of a look. It's um, basically this hexagram calls for joy in leading. Ignite the passion of others to tap their seeds of genius. So that's kind of a good start, you know, talking about that. So talking about a time of passion, a time of change, and, you know, and supreme success through following. In other words, by following the will of heaven. So that's what this generally talks about. So impelled or drawn into moving forward, um, you're called to follow. In other words, follow the leading of the Holy Spirit or the leading of spirit. That's kind of how I took this. And interestingly, the superior man enters and rests. So it's really a good time, like, like for me, like I saw that straight away, the pilgrimage. It's a good time to follow the will of heaven, listen to the voice, and generally a good time to go reflecting, go deep into yourself, and allow the winds of change to take hold of your life. That's what this is overall saying. Um, lines two and three is interesting. It talks about letting go of the old immature habits that we have. In other words, the old ways of doing things as a child. 
which to me just is an individual and there's going to be group levels of grit. It's a certain go of the old way of doing it, where we're just kind of being functioning at one level of existence where we're moving to the next level of greater maturity. So it's kind of a warning not to cleave to the little boy, in other words, the old way of doing it and not to follow what is inferior. In other words, go back to what's not important. So having immature attitudes. So not to surround with the incompetent. So there is a little bit of a warning there about increasing the goals and standards and getting rid of anything inferior, weak, and so that, and get away from, you know, from productive comp. In other words, staying in lower level ways of thinking and consciousness. And certainly Neville God is teaching today, we're we teaching how to improve our thinking, the way we see things, and even setting higher goals and standards for ourselves. So it's interesting what it says here, but many people think as young children and throughout their adult lives do not think any differently than as children. They kind of consider to think as if they were still six years old. So in other words, it's saying really move beyond a baby way of thinking and start to move to maturity. For me, the difference between a child and an adult, a child kind of passively has fun, they sit back, but don't really take responsibility for anything, whereas the adult takes responsibility. They step up, they rise to challenges, they set goals and standards, they grow, they move with the times and think responsibly. And then the next one, which kind of follows on, it says... Really, really good. It's actually talking about letting go. So this follows on perfectly. So Lion 2 talks about moving away from the inferior and moving to superior. I could not think of a better hexagram to fit in with what we're going to teach today because Neville Goddard's teaching is all about letting go of inferior thoughts and feelings and inferior attitudes and ways of being and goals you set and starting to set bigger ones. I've been getting this message personally for a few days now. I've had a few challenges in my life over the last couple of weeks I've been dealing with. And it's been interesting, even when I was at the chiropractor, it showed up. Just don't focus on the problem, just move on. Move on with your life, cleave to the better. And Neville Goddard says that. He says your outer world reflects your inner world. So if you, if you don't like the outer world, it's all coming from what you're thinking and feeling. And so the message was, has been to me for the last few days is really cleave and think about what you're looking to have, not what you're not wanting to have. Think about what you like, what you're wanting to see in your life. Think about the, what, you're, what you're desiring to manifest in your life. And think about the goals and standards you're looking to get, not clinging to the old fears and immaturities and insecurity. So, and it gives you clear guidance by staying with the strong man. In other words, by staying with the experienced way of being, you lose the immature way. So this kind of gives you the solution to line two, which warns you about holding on to the inferior ways and it's going to cost you and preclude growth. This one says that by cleaving to the higher, you start to move into the lower. And it just says it's advisable to make no move but to remain determined, which is interestingly is what the following hexagram is, 43, which is about determination and breakthrough and pushing through. So um, harvesting, residing in trial. So the man joins the superior people. So that's talking about different ways of thinking, but also changing the people that you associate with as well and parting yourself from former inferior elements in your life and starting to create new relationships with people around you and new ideals. And you'll not only find what you're looking for, but your strength of character will greatly benefit. Um, so it suggests a great growth, uh, exchanging an immature belief for a mature one. So that's a really good one. A great, 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 great message to start today. So on that note, let's get on now with what we're here to teach on, which is the feeling is a secret with Neville Goddard. So very exciting. Um, the power of the subconscious mind, feeling is a secret. So many of you have heard me teach on Raymond Grace, you know, everything is energy and energy can be transformed. But I've been more than ever getting back to using my bother, using what I've learned from Raymond and just shifting and transforming energy and seeing how amazing it actually can be. So in other words, he, Raymond constantly has his little expressions like focus on what you want, not on what you don't want. Um, books like Joseph Murphy and Neville Goddard talk about the subconscious mind and how it actually works in relation to the conscious mind. So Neville Goddard starts by saying, you're already that which you want to be, and your refusal to believe this is the only reason you do not see it. And I teach this, but every time I see this, I go, okay, this is answering things in my life at the moment, which are not going like I'd like it to be. So whatever it is you're desiring to be, you already are it, or you wouldn't have those desires. 
This is what he basically is saying and what Raymond Gray said. If you actually think about it and believe it and want it, it means you already are it. Otherwise, you wouldn't be thinking about it. For example, I have no desire whatsoever to be a computer programmer. I really honestly don't. So it's not something I think about. But let's say my desire, really genuine desire, is to actually be, and it was, I had a really a desire to be a really good dancer um, for years. And then one day I realized I actually am that. Now I'm dancing. And I actually last night was invited by a client who actually works as an exotic dancer to go down, meet her and some of her friends. And we we're having a bit of a chat. And I got to meet the manager of the clubs and um, just having some really good conversation and we mainly talked about Neville Goddard and spiritual laws and things like that and of course they're very impressed with my ability to do my dancing and my some of my pole dancing I've done for fun and now I was being asked about judging a competition which they're doing and that might happen so I was just laughing going wow this is so cool and um so yeah absolutely um it's so the point is basically I realized I always was that and for years, it was always my dream to be pretty much mainly focused as a spiritual teacher. And then I realized that actually, well, I am a spiritual teacher. And of course, that's now what I'm doing. So Peter Spann, a, a great um, motivational speaker who I heard years ago, once said that Wayne Dyer told him when he desired, he told Wayne Dyer, he said, my desire is to be a motivational speaker. He said, well, you already are one. He said, just say that to yourself and tell everyone that to you and it will happen. And he goes, yeah, but what else do I have to do? And he goes, don't think about the how, just say it. And he left him to do it. So for many months, that's what Peter Spann was saying, that I'm a motivational speaker and I'm one of the best in the business. And at that time, he'd never actually spoken on stage. But in due course, it, it manifested and he became one and he was doing it all over the world. So you already are that which you basically um, want to be and your refusal to believe it is the only reason you don't see it. So I like what he says here. Change your conception of yourself and you will change the world in which you live. Don't try to change people. They are only messengers telling you who you are. Revalue yourself and that will confirm the change. And it was interesting because I've had a couple of people in the last um, two weeks have some real issues with me. And what's been really pleasing for myself is how I've handled it compared to what I normally would. Normally, I would kind of do one or two extremes. I would either get very upset about the whole thing and go off at them. And, and contact them and speak to them, or I would then feel bad and kind of go and, and try and fix it. Whereas both people actually thought about it and thought, I actually don't have an issue with them. I really honestly don't. I don't have an issue with them at all. In fact, I like these people. The fact they have an issue with me actually genuinely surprises me. So if they wish to come and have a chat with me, they certainly can, and I'll happily have a chat with them because I really don't have an issue with them. I like both these people who have issues with me. And so I just went back into myself and I had a look at where I was perceiving those traits in myself that I was saying about me. And I thought, well, okay, I can see that. So I just saw myself just working more in myself and how I perceive myself. So that's the basic message of Neville Goddard and what he's saying here. I remember reading a book years ago by Merlin Carruthers where he says a, a pastor or chaplain, he said, um, and, he, and Margaret Court in her book, Winning Words, a great Wimbledon championship champion, said similar things. He said, ultimately, never try and change people, always change yourself. And Yvonne Christensen, in her book, wrote, Lord, don't change others, change me. And Joyce Meyer, who somebody may have heard who wrote a similar thing, she wrote, don't change people around me, change me. So he's pretty much confirming what's been said. Don't try and change other people. If you're having an issue with someone or someone has an issue with you, you're not going to change them. You can take that further. Don't try and change governments. They're just an agent or messengers telling you who you are and what you're up to. We value yourself and that will confirm the change. So in the book, Feeling is the Secret by Neville Goddard, I'm going to be reading extracts from the book and teaching and adding my own parts to this as we go along. Because this beautiful little book, it's a very short book. It's got basically, I'm counting exactly, it's got like about 35 pages or something like that in total, 36 pages. And he and, and basically teaches you four principles on manifestation and that. So the first chapter is called The Secret, The Law of Operation. And this follows on from Joseph Murphy. The subconscious doesn't know the difference but what is true and what is not real and is by and large a submissive organ. So the thing he says in this one is the subconscious is a submissive organ to the conscious. The conscious is the driving one. The subconscious submits. 
Because but the subconscious is what manifests. So Neville Goddard actually says that the feminine and the masculine, the subconscious is the feminine, the receptive that's designed to follow, and the conscious is the masculine desire to lead. So if your conscious can impress upon the subconscious something, the subconscious will simply take what you impress. So if you tell your subconscious you're an absolute idiot and you deserve to go broke, your subconscious, that may not be true, but your subconscious will say, okay, well, you're an idiot, deserve to go broke, I better make sure it happens. Um, even if it's a complete lie. Or if you tell your subconscious you're actually a great motivational speaker, money is not a problem in your life, you're going to be okay, the subconscious goes, oh, okay, and doesn't actually question it. And it's really interesting how Neville Goddard takes the Bible and some of the very controversial scriptures and show them applying in this esoteric sense. So as an example, in teaching this particular principle, Neville Goddard goes to Ephesians chapter 5, which many people do not like at all, but he actually talks about it from an esoteric. He says, Paul says, wives, submit yourself to your husbands as to the Lord. So he says, the husband is head of the wife. So he actually says, but think of husband as a conscious, wife as a subconscious, which, by the way, is exactly what Sri Yukeswa and Yogananda in the Kriya Yoga always taught this from the scriptures. They said a lot of these scriptures are more esoteric as to principle, but the feminine should always submit to the masculine. Now, it's not saying the woman submits to the man, so to speak. It's that the feminine submits to the masculine. Um, in other words, the masculine provides a leadership. The feminine is a receptive, which then listens, takes, and then manifests what the masculine cannot. So he's saying, think of it saying, subconscious, emotional body, submit yourself to the masculine conscious. And this is how you do manifestation. So it's quite powerful. And you start to see the Bible or any book in a whole different way. So he says, so hopefully for some of you, you're like, that's pretty cool. Because I certainly thought that was very, very cool. And it really was like, yeah, I like the way he puts that. So having a look at some of the things he says, I'm just going to read some extracts now. So he says, um, by knowing these laws of the secrets, you will accomplish everything you want. And as I said, I'm just going to read extracts because consciousness is the only true reality. So to intelligently operate the law of consciousness, it is necessary to understand how the conscious or masculine energy works with the subconscious or feminine. So the conscious is the realm of effect. In other words, the effect, the impact, the, the command. The subconscious is the realm of cause. So as an example, even in the Holy Bible, in the scroll of Isaiah, God says to Isaiah, you shall command a thing and it shall be done for you. So another way of saying it is your conscious shall command a thing and I, the higher intelligence, the subconscious, the receptive, the divine feminine, will manifest it for you. So the conscious creates an idea and impresses these ideas on the subconscious. So the conscious says, unless you work really hard on long hours, you'll never get wealthy. The unconscious goes, okay, and does this. I was actually talking last night with the manager of this particular script pub I was at about these spiritual laws, and we're having a bit of a giggle about it. Because she said, you know, um, I made a manifestation about having a house, and I got it within a very short period of time. I forgot to also add to have a house with grace and ease and straightforward. So I've got a house which is being built, but COVID's um, kind of, what's the word, um, delayed it. And so now I'm paying for the Anna rental house. And of course we laughed. So I said, yeah, you have to be more exact. And she said, yeah. When I said, well, many years ago, I created a manifestation about an amazing partner who I had great sexual, emotional, spiritual connection. I just failed to put in the grace and ease and harmony. And so it was an absolutely tumultuous one until it ended so the subconscious doesn't know the difference it just does what you tell it it's pure true divine feminine it just does what it's told and manifests what you tell it so if you as he says hold things in and don't express and start to think negatively of yourself in the world your unconscious goes oh shit you know i'm an asshole everything hates and you start to create disease so he says that the law is by conceiving an idea and impressing the idea on the subconscious, nothing is made without this sequence. It does not originate the ideas of subconscious, but I only accept that what is true and the, and the conscious mind believes to be true. 
So this is why it's really good to challenge your beliefs. Like, is it true you have to work long hours at an hourly rate to make money? I used to believe that for years. And I remember when I challenged that belief. And eventually I was like, well, I don't think that belief's right because I see people not doing a lot of work and manifesting large amounts of money through investing. There's royal families who have money and they don't do much at all. So really hard work is something you do for your own joy. It's not something you necessarily have to do to make money, although it can help and it can be part of the process. It isn't the only way to do it. So when I started saying, focusing more in a different way, like, well, I can make really good money by manifesting and by creating a good result for a client and a win-win kind of thing. I noticed that started happening in my life. So the subconscious transcends reasons and things like that is what it says here. So whatever you feel you are, it always dominates what you feel you would like to be. So this is a very important law that he says. Um, whatever you feel you are will dominate what you feel you would like to be. So if you actually feel you're broke or you feel that you're sick or you feel that you're not very good looking, even though you might look, you know, desire to look good, you might desire to be prosperous, you might desire to have money flowing into your life very, very easy. The wish must be felt as a state that is rather than a state that is not. I've experienced this even recently where at one stage I did everything possibly right physically I could have done and I still was having a little bit more belly fat than I really wanted. Now, don't, don't get me wrong, I wasn't fat, I was very lean, but comparatively there was a little bit more than it was relatively to the rest of the body. So in the end I thought, now this cannot be physical anymore, this has to be belief system. And sure enough, I realized that what I wanted to be wasn't what I felt I really was. I felt that I had a lot of emotional stresses around self-worth, around feminine, around a few other things stored in my unconscious, which was reflecting in my stomach and about not expressing my feeling and my softer side of me. So just bits like that, as I started to do that, I noticed that it started to help me. So Neville Goddard says, the dominant of two feelings is the one expressed. Saying I am healthy or I'm well on the way to being healthy is far stronger feeling than I will be healthy. Or I will be prosperous is effectively saying I am confessing I am not prosperous. I am prosperous is stronger than I am not prosperous. So it's just a logical chain of cause and effect. So if you're saying I will be prosperous at some stage, or I will be a good business owner, I will be a great spiritual teacher. I will be making a good residual income from investments. I will be healthy in my body. I will be in good shape in my etc. I will be in a really good relationship at some stage. What you're actually saying to your unconscious is I'm not in a really good relationship. I'm not healthy. I'm not prosperous. I have to work very, very hard. And that's the way it's got to be even though I'd like it to be differently. So your unconscious goes, okay, let's continue to give you what you're doing. So it says sensation precedes manifestation. So be very careful of your moods and feelings. But it was unbroken connection between what you're feeling and what the visible world is around about you. And all disease is caused by emotional disturbances and suppressed emotions, all disease. To feel intensely about a wrong without voicing or expressing that is what starts disease to take place. Never entertain for any length of the feeling of regret or failure for frustration. Only think of the state you desire to realize. And this is not saying you ignore or avoid or pretend it's not happening. But once you've acknowledged the, the disease or acknowledged the, 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 the fracture, it's time to focus on the remedy. So a change of feeling leads to a change of, 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 of destiny, but a subconscious never fails to express that which you've impressed upon it. And the moment it receives it, it will start to work out the way of doing it. And it will actually, the subconscious never alters except the beliefs of man. It outpixes them to the last detail, whether or not they're in any way beneficial. So chance or accident is never responsible for what happens to you nor is predestined fate the author of your fortune or misfortune. So, yeah, it's pretty damn good. 
I'm thinking you would all agree. It's pretty, pretty awesome. So, so therefore, to impress the subconscious with a desirable state, you must assume the feeling that would be yours as if you already realized your wish. So he then says again that the subconscious is the womb of creation. It never changes the idea that's actually received, but just simply expresses what you actually um, what you've actually given form to what you're actually thinking. So it will meticulously and in detail come up and put the very image of the thing that you're looking to achieve. So ultimately, he says the subconscious always serves man and gives form to his feelings. And I love what he says here. He says the husband is head of the wife may or may not be true of man and woman in the earthly relationship, but it is always true of the conscious and the subconscious or the male and female aspects of consciousness. So he said, the great mystery is he that loves his wife loves himself. In other words, by loving your own conscious, he says, um, and, and bringing like oneness to heaven and earth. So he says, the conscious or male aspect is truly the head and dominates the subconscious or female, but this is not of a tyrant where you force your subconscious and you're driving yourself by frenetic, harsh thoughts, but it's by working in loving harmony, the two together. So by assuming the feeling that would be yours, when you're already in possession of your objective, the subconscious is moved to build the exact likeness of your assumption. In the same way that a man or woman who's tried to be forced by the other party to do something will resent and resist or do it unwillingly, the unconscious is the same. So it's easier to blame what's going on to events in the world than to admit that the world around you truly reflects your feeling, despite the fact that the holographic universe and even quantum science now is saying that to be true. It's so easy to blame everything else around you. But he said, it is always and eternally and forever true that the outside will mirror the inside, which tells you what we've been saying for a while and me, that if you don't like the government that's going on in our society, we have a real problem with the consciousness of the collective. If we don't like what's going on in America and Australia with the governments, with uh, laws, we have a, a degree of the governments. I can only say that one conclusion leads to the other. And we've seen extraordinary results when we've shifted ourselves first and even seen things start to happen in the world around us. So a man can receive nothing in John that says, unless it is given him from heaven, because the kingdom of heaven is within you. Nothing ever comes from outside, it always comes from within, from the unconscious. So you're already that which you want to be, and your refusal to believe is the only reason you do not see it. So seek on the outside for that which you don't feel you are, is to seek in vain. But we never find what we want, we only discover what we already are to be. To him that has much is given, he says, and is being given. So therefore, mastery or self control of your thoughts and feelings is the highest achievement. However, until perfect self-control is attained, so that in spite of appearances you feel all that you want to feel, use sleep and prayer to aid you in getting into your desired states. And these are two gateways to subconscious. And that's going to be principles two and three we'll touch on shortly. Before I go on to principles two and three, anyone got any questions or comments? And a bit of feedback, who's actually enjoying this so far? Christine, it makes so much sense. It's 11, 11 percent. He said that, so right on par. It makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Isn't it brilliant? It kind of gives a lot of empowerment to realize how everything is our creation. Minyu says it's relevant to what I've been experiencing the last week. Yeah, well, everything I'm teaching today, I have been living completely in my own life. And if, as I'm listening to you, or listening to myself speak, I'm being taught, I'm like far out. It's about three situations in my life. I can see already I've got a, I'm going to be getting back into a better being state. Fiona, it's great to get this refresher. Yeah, it's pretty good, isn't it? So...
makes sense. Definitely need to get this book near yeah, to beauty. I like it because it's so short and only 36 pages. So really what he's saying is what we've been teaching in our courses that we manifest 24 seven, your mouth or your conscious speaks, your subconscious listens and your body manifests it. And that you're like a constant radio transmitter where you're tuning into things. So as Neville Goddard says to complete this chapter, now we'll look at the next one where he says, until you master the first law, you can use sleep and prayer to help you access. So let's look at the first one of the power of sleep to actually manifest and speed up your manifestation. And Raymond Grace actually said the same thing. He says pretty much what Neville Goddard says, and I want to simplify what he says here, because Neville, because what Raymond said is, your sleep is where you go back to your the, the void or the formless world. This is what Neville Goddard said. You're just pure energy in your sleep. So whatever you're thinking of before you go to bed will be processed in your unconscious. And you're going to wake up remembering and feeling it all. And so he says it's very important to focus on what you want when you're sleeping and what you're focusing on before you go to bed. And Raymond Grace used to talk about meditations and affirmations and there was times I was doing that every every night, and I've noticed a difference when I did that. So he said, the sleep is the life that occupies about one third of our time on earth and is a natural door into the unconscious. So he says, he actually quotes first from Job, and he says, sleep is like keeping a constant appointment with your lover. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon men, in slumbering on the bed, then God opens the ears of mankind and seals the instruction. Wow, isn't that powerful? Job 33. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon men, or REM sleep as we know it, like which is generally below about four hertz in neurofeedback measurements. In, and Raymond says, if you can get into a deep, um, what's called delta or REM state, in slumbering upon the bed, he opens the ears and seals their instructions. They've actually found that when yogis do great instant miracles, they're generally in that REM or delta state while awake. It is in sleep and prayer, a state akin to sleep, that man enters the subconscious to make impressions and receive instructions, and the male and female become one flesh. But in sleep, the male or conscious mind turns from the world to seek its lover or subconscious self. The subconscious, unlike the woman of the world who marries her husband to change him, <laughs> that's kind of a bit of a a cheeky pun, and by the way, Neville Goddard was a big believer in marriage and a great relationship with his wife, has no desire to change the conscious waking state, but loves it as it is and faithfully reproduces its likeness in the outer world of form. The conditions and events of your life are your children formed from the moles of your subconscious impressions in sleep. As is heaven, so is the earth. As in the subconscious, so on earth. So the unconsciousness of sleep is a normal state of the unconscious. So he said, as we said in the first chapter, to realize your dream, the wish must be resolved into the feeling of being or already have the very thing that you saw. You have to already have it. If you think it's something you want, so let's just say, oh man, I just, it's so, I really want to be healthy. That's all I want to be. What are you actually impressing on your unconscious? He says, you're saying, well, man, I'm not healthy. And that's all your unconscious hears. What's the best thing you can say? I can remember years ago when I had arthritic things, I just started saying, well, basically I'm, at the moment I said, I've got arthritis. My unconscious goes, oh, cool, you've got arthritis. Fuck, that's a bit of a bad little shit to give to yourself, but okay. And then I would have got worse. And at one stage I was actually doing that. I was just saying, I was focusing on it. I remember Raymond Grace and Toby Alexander at the time kicked my ass about it. So I remember starting to change it. And I started to just say things like, yeah, well, I may have symptoms, but I'm pretty much already better. These are just kind of messages from my unconscious for me to clean up and voice my truth a little bit more and to change my life. And I started fasting. I started doing things. I started saying daily, I'm already healthy and getting better really quickly. And within three months, I was fine. It was all gone. Just how many kids have we turned into autistic, Asperger's, ADHD, because we speak this kind of stuff over them and all they do up until the age of 12, according to all science, is they take on the thoughts and projections of the parents. So I was so careful what we were speaking over our sons, and I'm grateful that Grace was on the same page as me. 
that we spoke success from when they were young. I always, we always told Edward as a, as a child, this boy would be managing finances and be great in business. I always said about William from young, this was William the Conqueror. He changed the world. He'd be a great leader. He'd be, he'd take dominion. He'd take breakthrough. And that they were all born to be kings. And we're seeing that now manifest in their life. I've said that about James. He was born, his name means champion. He was born to be a champion. And he'll always be a champion. And you see that with him, the way he just has done stuff in his life and the way he overcame eczema at the age of eight with guidance. Josiah always said, this boy is a master. He's one of the truly greats. And I, I believe it. And I'm seeing all that happen in their lives now. Guys, you really don't have a lot of fear or thoughts about what people think of them. And the power to change that, but you can do the same to yourself as you, as you do with your kids. And by expressing and speaking these things about yourself and what kind of shit do we actually speak about ourselves? And how much do we try to change people around us rather than first change ourselves and then decide that something may not work for our reality rather than trying to frantically change that person? I'm even having a situation now where a situation happened on the Malwise trip that didn't quite go as I planned. And so I really, and, and, you know, a few of my friends had advice to me, but I said, I'm just going to ask myself what my own higher self is telling me on this. My own higher self told me, it doesn't really matter about what this person did. Change yourself and actually give them a chance to step up and change their behavior with you and acknowledge it themselves. And you'll never know if they're going to do that until you change yourself. If you change yourself, and they don't change with you and they pull back from you, you know you've moved beyond them. But first take responsibility for how you created this particular situation and what you were doing and where you are showing these traits in your life and get back to yourself. So I started focusing on myself again and creating what I was desiring. So sleep, he says, is a great way because it's where you go into that deep state. So he said, once asleep, you have no freedom of choice your entire sleep is dominated by your last waking concept of self. Therefore, it's critical to assume the feeling of accomplishment and satisfaction before you go to sleep. He then quotes from a series of scriptures which says things like, come into his thoughts with thanksgiving and singing in, in Psalm 95. Enter the gates of praise and his thoughts with praise and thanksgiving. That's Psalm 100. Your mood to sleep defines your state of conscious as you enter the presence of your eternal lover, the subconscious, who sees you exactly as you feel yourself to be. If as you prepare for sleep, you assume and maintain the conscious of success by feeling I am successful, you must be successful. Lie flat on your back with your head on the level of your body. If you've got a health thing going on, just go to sleep and as you're saying it, I'm already healthy, recovered, back to normal, and getting back into full state of good health. I'm already healthy again, and I'm and I'm in the pro and I'm already getting back into full health right now. And your subconscious hears that. So whether it's a shoulder problem as I or shoulder challenge I had at one stage, which has already been healing up exactly by doing this, whether it's some other thing, whether it was a knee thing which years ago I healed doing this, or whether it was a tooth issue like what happened to me when I was in Malvis, I started doing this and then got led to do some practical things, and it healed. Feel as you were when you're in possession of your wish and quietly relaxed in the unconscious. He that keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep, Psalm 121.4. Nevertheless, he always gives his beloved sleep, Psalm 127. It, that, that comes from, unless the Lord builds a house, we labor in vain to build it. Unless the Lord, the subconscious, the higher feminine receptive energy, watches over our city, we lay watch in vain because all of our conscious works to try and protect our assets and protect our health and watch out for government stealing our money are in vain. That's what it's saying. Because unless the Lord builds a house, spirit, our higher unconscious, we labor in vain. You can set up every structure. You can, you can protect your wealth like the world's greatest elite and you will lose your money. You can do everything right with your health and you'll have a horrendous accident or something that just takes your health from you. He says, in vain, you rise up early, wake up late, striving out of fear. Because the Lord gives rest to those he loves. The subconscious goes into a state of possession of rest and being, of great possession, knowing that it was already attained this desire, and goes to sleep in perfect peace, knowing that everything is fine. Sleep is a door through which the conscious waking mind passes to be creatively joined to the unconscious. What more beautiful description, son of Solomon, 
By night on my bed, I sought him in my soul loves. I found him in my soul loves. I held him and I not let him go until I brought him to my mother's house and to her who conceived me. That Song of Solomon, he says, fill yourself in a state of your answered wish and then relax deeply into your unconscious. Night after night, assume the feeling of being, having, and witnessing what you seek to be, possess, and manifest, and never go to sleep feeling discouraged or satisfied, or satisfied, or that you failed. See yourself as you do believe, whether it's true or not. Whether it be good, bad, or indifferent, your subconscious will always reflect it. Thou art all fair, my love. There's no spot in you. Song of Solomon 4 verse 7 is the attitude of the mind to adopt before dropping off to sleep. Disregard appearances in the outward world and feel that everything is as you wish to be. Signs follow, they do not proceed. So whatever you imagine you can realize, so he said it's all about assuming the feeling and every night as you drop off to sleep, feel satisfied and spotless so that your outward world can start to reflect your subjective inner world because your subjective level always forms the objective, your objective world in the image and likeness of your conception of it. So it's beautiful what he's saying here. So choose this day whom you serve, it says in the book of Joshua, is your freedom to choose the mood you assume, but the expression of the mood is a secret of subconscious and things like that. So he said, when you're awake, you're under compulsion to express subconscious expressions. If in the past you've been unwise in impressing this, change your thought and feeling for only then will you change the world. Never waste a moment in regret because to think feeling the mistakes of the past is to reinfect yourself. Let the dead bury their own dead, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 8, verse 22. Turn from outward appearances and assume the feeling that would be yours if you already had it. So accepting the end always means the means of realisation and will cause it to come about. So your only freedom is your reaction and your choice. So unless you consciously and purposely define the attitude of mind which you go to sleep, you will always go to sleep in the composite attitude of mind made up of all the feelings and reactions of the day. Each reaction makes a subconscious impression and unless counteracted by the opposite and more dominant feeling is the cause of future action. Raymond Grace gives a very practical example. He says he challenged everyone in his workshop to get water, hold the water every night before they went to bed for a minimum of three days just to project everything you desire um, into that, what you want to not, we don't want to drink the water because the water takes your impressions and go to bed. He said it takes three days for water to pass through your body. So in three days, if you do this, you will see it well after the fourth day, you'll wake up and see a big difference. And, I've, and it, it works. I, I, I challenge everyone to try it. When you awake, you are a gardener, selecting so seed for your garden, except the corn of wheat and fall into the ground and buys alone. It, 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 it buys alone, but if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. Your conception of who you are as you fall asleep is the seed you drop into the ground of subconscious. Sleep is a door to heaven, so sleep in the feeling of the wish fulfilled, as in consciousness or heaven, so on it. That's most of the book, so the last two principles are much quicker. Before we go on to these, anyone got any questions or comments on these before we go on to the next one? And keep in mind, most of what he's taught has been covered in these first two. The last, last two chapters are like a few pages each only. Okay, no comments. Let's go for the third one, the power of prayer. And this is basically the second gateway that Neville got out. So, so sleep is when you obviously go to sleep at night or even meditation. He said you can actually go into sleep by just lying down on the bed in during the day and go sleep. Sleep. I feel sleepy. I relax and just allow yourself to do that. And he said, and that can get you into a sleep state. Prayer is a more thing you do when you're awake by, by moving into a state of sleep. Christine says a whole new meaning to Bible scriptures. That I agree. I love what Neville Goddard says on this page, and that pretty much sums up chapter three. Prayer is just the feeling of the wish fulfilled. The only condition is that you believe that it's realized your prayer must be answered if you believe that. So exactly like Peter Spann did as a motivational speaker, I would feel myself in the situation of an answer of prayer. I was actually a spiritual teacher and a business owner in what I was telling everyone long before I was ever doing it. 
I had my own church and work long before I was actually doing it. I was dancing and doing that long before I was actually doing it physically. Then I would live and act my life because you're unconscious. The feminine always judges the masculine by their actions. How many times, men, have you heard a woman say, don't talk about it, just do it? Likewise, the unconscious watches not just what you say, but your actions. If you talk about prosperity, but then you live like you're a pauper, I'm not saying you go out and buy penthouse suites so we don't have much money. I'm just saying that, like all the time, you still got to have some wisdom. But in saying that, if you live like you're a pauper and you say you're prosperous and you're thinking that, you can say, for example, I'm already prosperous and I enjoy being wise of my money as I'm growing. That's now more congruent because you're saying I'm being wise of my money and as I'm growing, I'm, I'm enjoying a bit more. Things like that. That's why so many lottery winners lose their money because they don't actually believe it's theirs. So this, this scripture Neville Goddard uses as the key to his whole chapter three. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you've received it. Doesn't say believe that you will one day get it. Doesn't believe that you know at some stage in the days to come it will be yours. Believe you already have received it. And it will be yours. In other words, what he's saying in a quantum science is that the quantum realm works faster than the dense physical realm. Sometimes the physical realm can take a little bit of time to catch up to the quantum realm. But the moment you create the intention and you see it and know you have it, it's already done. And now all the currents of the universe of God starts to attract the, the forces to you to bring what you're looking for. We all know energy. How many of you can feel the change when you're with a person and suddenly they're different? And whereas previously you didn't like them, suddenly for some reason you like them more, you trust them more. A really good example in my own life is I've seen some of you who know it probably know some extraordinary change in Grace. I have, I've, I have a huge trust in her on a deeper level and everything she's doing in leadership like I've never had before. But you can see that it started because she started to believe more deeply in herself than she ever believed before. And in turn, what did that do? I let go more. Edward started believing more in himself, William. And so in other words, but until she believed that, or until I believe that with myself, that I'm that I truly can do this. Like I had this belief that unless I'm involved working long hours in anything that I'm doing, it's not going to work as well. Whereas when I was let go, I said, what if that's actually not true? What if the, I'm actually the hindrance? And the more I let go, the more the work will prosper. And that's what I've been doing over the last month. And I've been like, wow, that's what's been happening with everything. City Awakening. I've watched Grace and the boys step up more and other leaders in the team. And suddenly it's got this new direction without me even talking to them. And they all have up these ideas without me hardly saying anything to them. I've seen the change in everything around the business and things like that. So whatever you ask for in prayer, if you know and believe you received it, it's actually yours. So Neville Goddard just simply keeps it simple. We don't need to say a lot about this chapter. He said the perfectly disciplined man or woman just tunes in and knows it's an accomplished fact, speaks about it, and never gets put off by what he's seeing in the outward world around him. He just sees it as just part of the natural things that happen as you're moving into achieving your goal and just things dropping off. A bit like you're pruning a vine and things are just dropping off. On the other hand, the undisciplined, unruly man or woman finds it hard to believe what we're not seeing outside of them and accepts or rejects solely on what they see and things like that. So it's therefore critical to shut down your senses before you pray, before you can start to feel that which they deny. Whenever you're in a state of mind, I should like to, but I cannot, the less you can yield to your wish and you'll never attract what you want. So prayer is the art of assuming the feeling of being and having what you want. So you must create a passive state, a kind of reverie or meditative feeling similar to the feeling which precedes sleep. So that's what he says with prayer. It has to be similar to sleep because then the mind goes to the objective world and senses the reality of subjective state. An easy way he suggests practically to create this passive reflective state is relax in a comfortable chair or bed, lie flat on your back with your head in bed on the level of your body, close the eyes and imagine you're sleepy, Feel I am sleepy, so very sleepy, and before you know it, a faraway feeling will come and a loss of all desire to move envelops you. 
you feel a pleasant, comfortable rest. You will not want to alter your position. And you will um, notice that when this passive state is reached, you'll imagine you've realized your wish and the wish has been fulfilled. Imagine what you desire to achieve in life and feel yourself as having achieved it. Thoughts produce tiny little speech movements and things like that. So all you can need or desire is already yours and pull your desires into being by imagining and feeling your wish fulfilled. And as soon as you come from prayer, his final comment is see it like you've just been shown the happy and successful end of a movie or play, although you were never shown how the end was achieved. So he says, think of it like yes, you're watching the last 10 minutes of a movie. You see in the end, you love it, but you just don't know what led up to it. So he said, so having witnessed the end, regardless of any anticlimactic sequence, like a, a, a challenge that happened in between the time, like movies often do, you remain calm and secure knowing it's been done. So before we go on to the last one, which is about spirit and feeling, any comments on this one or reflections before we finish off with this? And this is, I think, it's a two and a half page chapter, this one. This is just a conclusion of everything. I'm just letting you know, because I know we're going a little bit longer today, but I feel this is important. So, assume the feeling of your wish fulfilled and observe the route that your attention follows. So, Neville Goddard's quoting scripture is this one, to start off. He quotes from Zechariah in the Holy Bible, not by might, nor by power. In other words, not by conscious force. I Help me. I am prosperous. I will make this happen. I will do this. I'll do that. I'll do this. I'll do that. They're active, reactive, frantic minds. But by my spirit, my unconscious, says the Lord God Almighty, a higher self, just by my spirit. In other words, not by forcing, just by a simple command and letting spirit manifest it. It's pretty powerful, isn't it? So, not by might. So, get into the spirit of the state desired by assuming the feeling that would be yours, where you're already the one to receive it. And thanks for the great comments, everyone. Glad you're enjoying it. As you capture the feeling of the state sort, you relieve of all effort to make it so. Why? It's already done. You don't need to force it. It's already been done. There is a definite feeling associated with every idea. Just know that it's done and then you won't be striving, running around, forcing anything. According to your faith, so it will be unto you, Matthew 9, 29. You never track what you want, but always what you are. As a man is, so does he see. To him that has, it shall be given, and to him that does not, it shall be taken away. That which you feel yourself to be, you are, and you're given that which you are. Assume the feeling that would be yours where you're already in possession of the risk, the wish, and your wish must be realized. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, being in the form of God, feel it not robbery to be equal with God, Philippians. You are what you believe yourself to be. So I love what he finishes off by saying here. Instead of believing in God or Jesus, know that you are God or that you are Jesus. Now that, that certainly is going to make the churches go, oh. And I believe it's been one of the biggest disempowerments of the people, this trying to get people seeing God outside. It's how the original churches and the ancient Catholic churches in the Dark Ages control people. It's just actually realizing that we are gods. Jesus even said that to his disciples. Do you realize you are gods? In other words, we are God. I and the Father are one, Neville God says. In fact, when Jesus actually said, he never said, have faith in God. I tell you the truth. Whatever you ask for in prayer, you believe. He said, have the faith of God. That was the actual original translation. Have the faith as if you are God. So if you know you're God and you can trade anything, then you shall. He even says you can move a mountain physically. There are great sages and masters who brought fire from heaven. Sai Baba in the world today has manifested um, gold nuggets in front of journalists. Um, Dr. Adrian Clark has witnessed monks levitating in thin air, just saying there's a stone underneath him. Dipper Ma was seen regularly flying and levitating around and teleporting and going invisible. The great Buddhist master. Um, 
I know there's guys in Perth who can actually do like the Matrix. They can bend spoons and they can move things because they can see it. I've met a man in, in Virginia who hasn't eaten for 25 years because he just said, I don't live by bread alone. I choose that every time I drink water, that gives me my nourishment that I need. In their autobiography of a yogi, Therese Neumann was studied and they found for 50 years she'd never eaten food. So the point is, if you believe your God or Jesus and that anything is possible, it shall be done for you. Jesus found it strange to not do the works of God because he believed himself to be God. I am the Father of one. It is natural to do the works of the one you believe yourself to actually be. So live in the feeling of being the one you want to be and what you desire and that you shall be. One of the things that Gerald O'Donnell, for example, in his remote viewing consciousness, he talks about when he used to train traders, he said most traders lost money and it wasn't really much wrong with their system. He said it was because their main focus was on their fear of losing their money. So what he said was inevitably, no matter how good their system was, they actually manifested a loss of money. He said the small number of traders who were actually able to discipline themselves and focus on what they wanted and actually bring their fear under subjection, they would actually make very good money from trading. So whatever a man believes in the value of the advice given and applies it, he establishes himself within the reality of success. Okay, so if you believe you can do something, as Raymond Grace says, you probably can. On that note, I'd like you to reflect and share your greatest lessons and actions in the chat. We'll take the mic, whatever you'd like to do, and I'll get Grace and hand it over to Grace and anyone else Grace wants to call on camera to maybe discuss and reflect now on the lessons and make sure we implement these lessons in real life and not just walk away having watched a good Netflix show. So maybe Grace and the team can come on and help out and Edward or whoever and just reflect. <coughs> Hello. That was um, that was is is brilliant. Again, it's about applying it, isn't it? Um, how do we work wisdom? And uh, and to work wisdom is actually applying the knowledge. Yes. And and it's the easiest thing to do is actually just do it. Couldn't agree more. I was actually reflecting about um, sleep, what came out um, the last few minutes, you kept bringing up sleep. And uh, I'm just, because I'm one that actually hardly sleeps. Um, I used to sleep on average about three hours a night. And I noticed um, the last few months, I've been really practicing um, to sleep longer. And I can see my state has changed, has transformed in having more sleep. Um, and it's it's something, isn't it? We take so, take really advantage or um, take it for granted. But when we're working on this transformation, manifestation and being the creator, it's so important to have that sleep, the sleep of consciousness and yet could be conscious. So, what did you want to do, Warren? Did you want to go through practical? Or... Well, this is where I think you or the other things come and reflect and give their lessons. I don't really, I mean, obviously I've shared some practical things people can do, but, you know, invite people to come on camera and share their lessons, like Edward or William or anyone else yeah. who's in this webinar who'd like to take the camera. That's what I would actually, suggest. Actually, William's making me toasty at the moment. So you, the noise that you hear, he's making toasty on the air fryer. <laughs> <laughs> Dave says, I manifested Warren, you poor man. Crikey, I'm crazy. <laughs> Love your message today, Grace and Warren. <laughs> uh, again, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not your wife, Dave, so remember that. <laughs> again, um, isn't it wonderful? That's why, sure, we go through challenges, obstacles, um, hair raising things. At the end of the day, whoever's in front of us is, is our mirror. And so, what Warren. I mean, seriously, I've got to be honest, guys. I mean, I've known Warren for 30 years now, over 30 years. And to this day, I still cringe every now and then of all his escapades. Now, I'm normally the, in front, I'm kind of the straight-laced ones. 
And again, I have to ask myself constantly over the years, where is that in me? Where's the craziness? Where's the, how is this manifesting in my life? Um, obviously, because one's in my life, because there's something in me that I'm denying in myself. And I have to give him the honor of saying that he doesn't hold back because by not holding back, it shows me, it helps me looking in the mirror. <laughs> so we're, we're about um, working in the mirror, we? working in our shadows, working in all the stuff that Warren has shared. Christine, I think I manifested you doing this session, Warren. I've wanted you to do this for quite a while, not that I've mentioned it to you. <laughs> I've actually got more to come, Christine. I actually was saying to Grace, because Emma was going to be teaching on finances and, you know, the higher laws of finances, and and I'm going to be doing a few more on Neville Goddard and possibly Joseph Murphy and others. So that's my plan for the next little while to really teach manifestation in the way people can relate to, because, yeah, I think Neville Goddard is just terrific. Yeah. Um, well, Warren has shared the message today, ladies and gents. So I invite you now to actually, let's really work this through. And um, something like this uh, has to be done through, uh, at the moment, we're, well, for you, some of you might be able to telepathically read people's minds. Um, but let's practice what's been uh, shared this morning. Or this afternoon for some of you let's really practice what this all means what neville has been sharing and also done by by warren sharing neville's stuff today it, it just goes to show there is no thing for us is there because his his energy his spirit we're drawing from the data information from source and bringing it in in our time that is profound because Peter, the astrologer, said to me today that there was no death because he said, Warren, he goes, I can't help but feel all this humanitarian work we're doing in the Bali in India, Sammy's spirit is here guiding us because that's what she wanted to do. Absolutely. Um, I mean, my mum passed away physically over 10 years ago and I sense, I still sense her voice. Her voice is still my, in my head when I look at the garden, the state of my house. So she's very much still alive. And also the Bible says, you know, the last thing that we will conquer is death. So again, part of the learning the consciousness is you have to experience it. You've got to go through the experience yourself. So um, I know for me, I know that there is no death. I continue to live. Even if I shed my body, I know I continue to live because I'm infinite. Now, there's other parts of me that I have to continue to work in my shadows, like loving myself. Well, that's one of the biggest things for me because of my conditioning in, as a child, you know, um, <clears throat> brought up from not being wanted and, and all that stuff. My mom tried to abort me three times when she was pregnant of me. So that is my kind of foundation. But in saying that, the benefit of that is that it's driven me to this work. So how was it for you? You know, I really encourage yes. you to get on camera. How exactly. was it for you? Let's really hear from others. Because again, we only learn and glean from each other. We learn from one another's experience. And as you speak out and take the courage to speak out, um, we're just mirroring each other. And as you speak out, you, you can hear yourself and be an observer. Yeah, Grace, I'd, um, I, I, the, the thing... I'd like to share. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. Very well. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I didn't catch much of it cause just traveling back from holidays. But when um, <clears throat> when I saw the topic, you know, the feeling is the secret. The thing that, that sort of jumped into my mind was the, the more modern way of saying that is that heart-mind coherence. You know, so Neville Goddard says, you know, we have to feel it to manifest it. And, you know, the Heart Math Institute's um, research has shown that when our heart and our mind is in coherence, it, that, that's just a different way of saying that um, more, I won't say ancient, but that, you know, that more um, or that older concept, you know. And so I guess the, 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 the revelation out of all of that for, for me is that how much everything is intertwined 
and how much or how consistent, even though it's said in so many different ways, mm. how consistent that message is across so many platforms from so many different teachers. Mm. Um, you know, and yeah, and then so that, that heart-mind coherence thing is, uh, is a really big thing because the, because the key to that, right, is, is getting the feeling right. The feeling is the secret. And our heart, obviously, is the place where we feel. Mm. What's on there, Grace? Is that um, ham and cheese or we got chicken cheese mayo? Like, what's well done for you there? William just... Um, what did you manifest there? Tasty. <laughs> cheese on toast. I wanted something simple, but one, one called in earlier. So I'm going to have a cold cheese on cheese. <laughs> you, man you manifested that well. <laughs> I did. The, the great timing, wasn't it? But, again, <laughs> but what's that there? So I was seeking food and the food I was seeking was the physical, but really subconsciously what I'm really wanting to feed myself second, and cultivating myself and feeding myself. So hence, um, Warren got me back here. Because really, I'm really hungry for the spiritual things. So it, this is just a substance, um, a copycat. <laughs> and so that's my message for, for this. <laughs> and the fact that it's cheese and it melted. So in cultivation, it's melting right into my soul, the deliciousness of it. So this is much, this is the real thing. So there you go, Steve, how's that? Well, <gasps> yeah, perfect. <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the outer world reflects the inner world, right? As above, so below. Yeah. Great example. Yeah. And again, you know, when you look at it, um, heaven is not about eating and whining and dining and, and all that stuff, isn't it? It's um, all about expansion, transformation. And where can we go next? That's why, really, why wouldn't you want to be in this path? on this path it's full of challenges it's full of um things that can try to trip you it's <laughs> when you look at it it's actually fun i mean it sure might not be fun when you're in a firing line when you're in pain physically mentally emotionally but when you get out of it how many of you have experienced well well i made that <laughs> i survived it we're all survivors we all thrive <clears throat> Unit, come on, unit, come on, unit. Have what's your thoughts? Well, the the biggest thing for me was that you are already it from birth. You are who you are, and and that just ties in with following our 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 path, our passion. And if you don't, you just stumble through life or be, you know doing a job you don't like or you know marry the person you don't like or whatever is in your life but for me that's that's really the first thing that resonated with me that um that we born with the characteristics or or the the talents or whatever that that comes through life and if you follow it then um, we'll have a successful, happy, or, you know, all positive sort of life. But, uh, yeah, when, when you kind of go against that, that inner voice, that whispering that you hear within you, bye. Yeah, sorry, just my visitors leaving. <laughs> um, <laughs> then you, uh, you, you kind of things just don't go, just don't work in your life. So yeah yeah excellent yeah. and i'm working on this myself and uh, and it's it's also how important that we um when we have children to look at them and, and just see what is their talent what they're passionate about and nurture that rather than trying to make them someone who they not just because you know dad is doing that professional mom is doing they have to follow it they don't. They they have to follow what they were born to. It's true, you know, because um, when my boys were little, I used to say to them, whatever you guys want to do, 
mm. you just do it for the best and mm. really if you want to be um uh, you know a rubbish collector do it with all your mind with all your heart yeah. uh, whatever you want to do and whatever you want to create just do it really well for you mm. yeah mm. yes that's good christine you come off camera did you want to say something Yes, I'm. Uh, this the first time I ever read um, Neville Goddard's words were, or this little book that um, Warren's been teaching from today was it was absolutely profound for me, and um, I think the biggest message really is that not only can you change yourself by changing the way that you impress your thoughts on your subconscious mind, it it changes other people when you think of them differently. And it's just so amazing. You know, that's just incredible. And I've seen it with people around me. And and it, um, I guess it sort of makes you softer towards other people that you would have criticised more. And I often pick myself up on that. Um, and so it's changing your whole world, really, because you change, you're changing yourself and you're creating the things that you want. But you can also influence others by not pushing your thoughts on them but the way that you think about them and um, that's really profound for me yeah mm -hmm. and the other thing I, I I noticed that when Warren was reading the scriptures today you know thinking about them from a different point of view just you know changes the whole aspect of what it actually says mm. Mm. <clears throat> yep Again, there's a huge connotation of the church too, isn't it? Um, church is us. We we are the temple. And we start, when we shift our mind, our paradigm, to that we are the church, we are the temple, um, we really want to really look after ourselves. Yeah. How's your temple today, Christine? Oh, it's good. Good. I've manifested, I've manifested great healing grace. So it's really yeah. fantastic. <laughs> no, I really, honestly do. I'm feeling much better. It's really good. Oh, um, that's awesome. Awesome. Because I know yeah. you know, I've been discussing this, um, you know, that little book for months now, isn't it? And I haven't mentioned mm -hmm. anything to Warren. And so when he first mentioned thought, oh, this is that's what he wants to share. And I'm like, holy crap. Christine's going to love this. <laughs> I must have picked up your parents it. in the ether, Christine. Uh, <laughs> you know, I think I've said to Grace a couple of times, I uh, wish Warren would teach this, but it has to be a time and a place, and I think this is probably the right time. So thanks very much, Warren. It's been really good. Oh, my pleasure. So since you've been, um, you know, since you first picked up the book, Christine, I mean, what in a practical sense uh, how has it changed your life i mean when do you, you picked it up i think about a year ago isn't it it probably is hard to remember exactly the time seems to have vanished yeah. um that profound revelation of consciousness it was just it's like it turned my life around really mm. um and i guess i had to um really um it was profound, but I had to sort of start living it. And even now, sometimes you doubt yourself, um, or do I doubt myself, and that sort of thing. But I know that it's true because I've manifested so many things. And and sometimes you only just have to think about it, and it happens. And you think, wow, you know, the the synchronicities are just amazing. And I think it. Um, what was your question again? How has it changed my life? Mm, has that's it that Mm, has it transformed? Yeah, I, I think when things happen that, um, so you, you sort of are in the process of trying, of um, manifesting stuff, and the way it happens doesn't always turn out the way that you think it's going to happen. And so therefore you think it's something that's bad, say you not good or challenging or whatever word you want to use. But when you look at it objectively, you think, wow. It's turned out in a way that you've never thought that it could possibly happen. Um, 
and then so now you know I th when something happens I think oh this is going to be interesting what happens now so it's really changed the way I think about things mm. I guess mm. yeah if I, I could give an example for instance um we had I was had a trouble getting an electrician and all of a sudden one manifests and they came and they did this and that and all the other things put a plug in to run a generator if the power went out so guess what a few days later the power went out had a massive storm plugged the generator in and um not all the places that i thought should work worked so really it was a, a it was sort of like a trial run because now it's going to be fixed properly and it'll all be sorted you know so that sounds like a little thing the other thing was that he discovered that um there's some wiring not working in our garage and he's um, disconnected it. So in that way, there's a possibility that somebody might not get electrocuted, you know, so it sort of changes your whole way of thinking and it will get fixed. Mm. Yeah, so you just don't know how it's going to turn up. <laughs> That's the amazing thing about it. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, especially you've got so many things responsible in your farm, eh? So many things that you've got to <laughs> uh, think outside of the square. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. No, that's good. Thanks, Christine. Um, just to finish it off, uh, Warren, are you able to share the video that um, Peter um, shared with you yesterday? Uh, what, you know, the one that he took film, the orphanage? Because, uh, you weren't here earlier, Steve. So what we're doing is City Awakening is actually working in conjunction with Peter, the Vedic astrologer in Bali. Um, we're going to start supporting the orphanage in Bali and we're giving funds to Peter to actually give it to the orphanage. Yeah, so okay, I'll try. That will be my last thing we'll do. So just let me... Yeah, just to end it, because I thought... Is, um, I forgot to ask you yesterday, can you show me what he, you know, what happened? Okay, yep, I've got a couple of videos. So, okay, hold on. Handicap disabled people, yeah. kids with needs. Yeah, that's what he's saying. Yeah, so thank you so much for your donation, and we're making like an invoice right now for the the, the school for C, or the organization that helps all the children in Bali and the orphanages and other privileged have C. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'll show you the second one now. Yep. Kitchen. For the orphanage. Kitchen. Special needs school. For the special needs school for disabled kids. I think art rooms they're building they want to get funds for building a tour at some stage but yep yep we can definitely fund that using the classrooms classrooms for the school wow it's a great setup mm. is this in ubud yeah a the building. There's, they have a therapy room in the back. Therapy room, you probably have that. Do therapy for some of the handicapped Therapy to do for handicapped kids who've got they suffering. Have like a, a pool. A pool for handicapped that kids. Donated. That was donated. Donated pool for handicapped. Brilliant. Yeah, so this is the handicapped area where they 
Das ist das Swimming Pool. Ja, Swimming Pool für Heiligkeit. Ah, gut. Much needed. Yeah. Ah, now this is a great cause. Yes. Mm. How exciting is this to be part of I'm, it? I'm so excited. If you're doing construction, maybe that's my friend Lisa from Australia. I think that's the art room. Art room. That they're building. Building art room so they can express themselves. Yeah. So. The beauty is we can. I really love the couple. We run the place. And there's no kids here today. But usually this place is packed. It will be packed. The buses here that they use, here are the wheelchairs for a lot of the kids. A little stage would be great to do a performance here. So that's it. That is so brilliant. The questions on. How good is that? That's brilliant because, again, finding your purpose and your mission, what you're about, will, you know, because the reality is I'm not practical, neither you, Warren, but what we can do is drum up finance, eh? And we can finance um, that area. So, you know, if you can find your place and how to assist them, you know, how you can um, get involved, uh, that's part of that, oh. what we're good at. So, we can um, certainly um, um, inject inject funds to that one. Yeah, well, of course, in the PayPal account, I mean, if the money comes into that, I'll be sending money over to him next week. So if anyone's like, yeah, baby, we want to put a bit of money towards that. Um, if it goes in the account, we'll just basically get it. We are, Peter and I are talking about setting up a proper foundation. Over yeah. a while, but for now, I just said look, I'll just... Talk to different people, see who wants to help out, and then we'll just um, send it to him, and he'll be reporting and getting back to me. He's pretty excited because he said I actually like doing this. He said it's That's um, cool. he really likes going to the places and practically talking to them yeah. and helping them out. So, mm. which is and great because I, I don't. <laughs> yeah, and the fact that we know Peter, well, you know him more than me, but um, the fact that we know him and we know that. 100% of the funds will go there rather than take some from administration because, yeah. um, you know, if anyone needs a, a Vedic astro astrology reading, um, Peter is really a good one uh, and certainly will fund his lifestyle. But, um, again, that's separate to funding the, the orphanage. Well, yes. what, what I do with him regularly, just so everyone knows, because obviously he pays expenses to go down there, so I regularly give him a donation as well. So let's say that yeah. there's 500 for the orphanage, I might send him 111 or something else just to give him, make sure he's covered as well for his expenses. And that, that to me is perfectly fine to be using money to help that kind of stuff, you know. It's when you have this person, this person, this person being paid. So, yeah. you know, by the end of it, you've only got like 5% going to the actual work. Yeah, because the thing is, he's 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 putting all his energy, his prayers, his everything about him, and also he's physically going in there um, to do the work. So definitely he deserves it. Yes. Cool. Well, we'll end it there. Thank you so much for being here, and uh, um, I'm excited to go in the new direction where we're going. Really more hands-on and showing way, showing you. Be good to have, have an update on the orphanage one. And oh, you bet, don't you worry. I'll let you know any money that comes today. I'll get it across to him and give him a nice, perfect surprise and say, "Hey, bro, you're going to be <laughs> you're going to be throwing shoes everywhere. We're going to be the Imelda Marcos of Bali." <laughs> 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 But you don't need 3,000 pairs of knickers. <laughs> no, to one person, yeah. <laughs> All right. We'll end it. Thank you so much. Have a good afternoon or evening, yeah. whatever you guys are doing, and we'll see you next we'll, time. Let Dave train with email the Marcos at Perth. <laughs> and now I can go back to my toasted cheese. <laughs> okay. See you later. Yeah. Bye. Bye.